Hello, my name is this old Tony. My name is this old Tony, and there's a little something I thought we could talk about. Not long ago, I shared a video about a soft, spongy rear brake and the emotional and mental anguish I went through to repair it. In my particular case, a bad rotor or brake disc was to blame. The rotor presented with no readily apparent signs of degradation, which unfortunately led me on a wild goose chase for every other possible explanation for the problem. That and spending a lot of money. In said video, I discovered my brake rotor was worn. Replacing the rotor solved the soft spongy brake problem immediately. However, quite a few skeptic viewers took to their keyboards to inform me that, although I had repaired the ailing brake, it was not, and in fact could not be, due to a worn rotor. That my logic was faulty. That the hydraulic system would have accounted for rotor wear, even if the rotor got so thin as to become transparent. The more likely culprit, they added, was a warped rotor, pushing the pads in with every revolution, and robbing me of a full braking stroke. Well, to that, I have a few things to say. First, I never felt, heard, smelled, nor tasted any evidence of rotor warp. However, and this is point number second, I think you're totally right. I mean, your warped rotor theory is a pile of smelly poop, but you're still right. In my excitement, I may have fell victim to a causation fallacy. A thin rotor should not have caused a soft break. So you're correct in that I now agree. Changing my rotor caused something else to happen, which in turn inadvertently solved my problem. Stuck caliper, crooked pad, I don't know, but not a thin rotor. Third, this is my last though most important point. The video was very clearly titled, I'm an idiot. Nonetheless, me having led you astray, having perhaps betrayed your trust, unintentional as that was, has sat wrong with me ever since. I haven't been sleeping. I haven't been able to look at the bike the same way ever since. In fact, after fixing it, I've hardly even taken it out. Sure, the weather's been terrible, but still, as a conscious man of integrity, there was only one thing to do. I sold that bike and got another one. That has got to be the single longest setup for a video I've ever done. This video isn't about this bike specifically, though we'll be doing some mechanical tomfoolery. That's why it's out. Big picture though, for those three or four of you out there that might be interested, this is a Scorpa. And it's not a new bike. It's got a few years on it, but it's a lot fresher than the last one. Generally speaking, I'm not usually a new anything kind of a guy. Never in my life owned a new bike or a new car or a new anything of consequence, really. Even stuff like smartphones and camera gear, I'm more of a get a good deal on a low mileage used kind of a guy. In fact, even my wife, I've jumped ahead almost 10 model years. Compared to the old one, this thing feels like I could fly it to the moon. All aluminum, tech front suspension, a purple rear shock. All of the linkages are still connected to each other. It's got a turning radius so tight that for a brief moment I can see into the past. And when you just have a look at that, a serviceable muffler. Ain't that a kick in the pants. And you want to know what else it's got? Drooping pegs. See how they sort of point down and out? I'm no expert, but I don't think they're meant to be like that. Usually they're right on the level. Maybe sometimes tipped inward, but I've never seen them droop outward. Maybe I'm out of the loop, but to me that feels weird. And to be quite honest, I don't even know how that happens. I'd like to break these things down, see if there is any excessive wear anywhere, and maybe fix them. This bike came standard with S3 hard rock foot pegs. These are some nice pegs. I mean, these set you back a pretty penny. They're also missing a few screws on each side. That's not great. They're aluminum and they use steel grub screws for grip. Now for the riding that I do, at my age, the foot peg angle doesn't really make a difference. As long as my feet don't slip off and I end up with a shot to the family jewels, any foot peg for me is totally fine. But moving from the other bike onto this one, I feel weird. It feels awkward. They make my feet point out. I feel like a penguin. I know what you're thinking. That's not what a penguin sounds like. And maybe you're right. This angle is just simply set by a stop. The length of the back end of this peg here touches up against the frame, and that sets the level across the bike. The plan was to simply take these off the bike, add some weld material at the end of that stop, make it a little bit longer, and size it so the pegs are level. However, plot twist, 
These pegs are made out of a non-weldable aluminum alloy. There's a Johnny Five Dentures joke here somewhere. If you've watched my welding videos, hopefully you remember the warnings I dish out about being very careful about what you choose to weld. And that just because you've bought a welder or have learned to weld, you should be very careful how you apply that skill. Just because you can, or you think you can, doesn't always mean you should. Case in point, 7075 aluminum. According to the manufacturer, these are 7075T6, which means they're a 7075 grade aluminum alloy with a T6 temper for heat treat. And 7075, fun trivia fact, not weldable. To further complicate things, 7075 will take a weld bead if you lay one on it. It's not like they'll explode or red lights will go off or the welding cops will come knocking at your door. But within a day or two, perhaps, you'll find your parts have cracked right in two. Your welds will have all split open and your nice work will look a lot like a bag of pretzel pieces that's been run over by a truck. A truck that was delivering pretzel pieces. I mean, what are the odds? In my case, I was lucky enough to find this material spec online. The manufacturer of these foot pegs tells you what they're made out of and what the temper is. Usually when they do that, it's mostly for marketing purposes because they're using fancy aircraft grade materials. It's not there on the off chance you want to modify their product and you're curious what they're made out of. But what if you don't know? Or in more differenter words, how do you know if what you're looking at is weldable or not? Correct. You do not, and therein lies the extremely danger. Certainly, if you're buying material for a welding project, don't buy 7075. That'd be a very expensive mistake. But if you're fixing something, use your head. If the part has welds on it, you can probably weld it. If it's bolted together, or there are no signs of welds, there might be a reason for that. Weld at your own risk. We should talk about what just happened. As you may have guessed, I did discover some wear on the back side of the pegs. Not quite straight and not quite even. It's usually how wear goes. In addition, the bolts are complete trash. So the wear on the bolt, the wear in the holes of the pegs, in the hinge, and the wear in the back came together in such a way to have the pegs droop. So after everything I said, why did I weld them? For my particular case, I made the executive decision that although risky, shy of just buying a new set of pegs and throwing these out, this was my lowest risk option. Thought about putting some set screws in there, drilling and tapping for some set screws I could adjust, but there's not a lot of meat there, so the screws wouldn't be very large, which in turn means a lot of stress, and I could see those easily cracking. Then I thought about putting in a spacer, like mechanically retaining a spacer, maybe with a rivet through the top or something. But if that came loose, it could bind things up and again, extremely danger. Now in welding, in this case, I'm not joining two pieces together. I'm just adding some padding material. And most things, I'm shooting from the hip here, I haven't completely thought this through, but I think most things tend to fail in tension when you pull or bend something. These weld pads would always be loaded in compression up against the frame. Sure, they've likely developed some internal tensile stress from the cooling of the weld bead, but I can't imagine at this scale, I didn't add that much material, that might do enough to split the 7075. I did mess with the temper, obviously, back there, but I don't think that made it back into the hinge area. And perhaps most importantly, all of the risk is mine. This is my stuff. I'm the end user. If something stupid happens, I get hurt, not somebody else. That, and given how much wear these hinges have in them, I'll probably replace these sooner than later anyway. Probably with nothing this fancy, but you know, they might not spend a long time on the bike. All right. Much better than before. Nothing left to do but try it out. The left side turned out a smidge high, but that's the machinist in me talking. It's not enough for me to really worry about. I suppose it's easy enough to flip it up and hit it with a file. But for now, that's perfect. I think I'm just going to move around some of these set screws. They're missing one or two on the outsides where they're more important, I think. But enough about the foot pegs. While I was down here, I noticed something else. 
This bike is missing its guard on the rear sprocket. See that machine surface in the two holes? A sort of upside down shark fin goes there. I think it's meant to keep stuff from getting in between the sprocket and the chain. Most of the time, if things are going well for you, the bike is moving forward. And where the chain meets that sprocket becomes a pinch and or shear point. So let's make a new... I'll have you know, one of these things has got to cost at least $9. I've cut this out of PVC. Maybe not the best choice, but it's all I've got on hand. PVC is extremely strong, but can be a bit brittle, especially now that it's getting colder. PVC in sheet stock like this likely has more plasticizer in it than PVC pipe you might be more familiar with. So maybe it's not as brittle, but something like polypropylene or nylon might have been a better fit maybe ABS. You'd want this to be strong enough to reject anything trying to get into that pinch point, but you don't want it to make the situation more dangerous if it does break and leaves behind like very sharp jagged edges. Though maybe it would be better to have your foot shorn off before it goes through that meat grinder. Just goes to show you, good design can be a tightrope walk of compromise. If you haven't noticed, I did take this out for a spin last night. Pegs do feel much better. Maybe not night and day, but at least now I don't feel like a penguin. Thanks for watching.